Hi, this is Jose Figueroa with an Approved Workman, where we are rightly dividing the word of truth. Welcome to another week of Bible study. I am glad that you're here as we open up God's word one more time. Our current series is Rebuilding on the Solid Rock, a study of the book of Ezra. If you're new to this Bible teaching ministry, here is how you can learn more about our work. First, you can go to our website, www.anapprovedworkman.org. Uh, that's anapprovedworkman.org. On the website, you can learn more about the, about the purpose of this ministry, our approach to Bible study, and also review our statement of faith. You can listen to previous episodes of our current series or any episodes from the many series we have done previously on the podcast. You can also subscribe to the podcast, which is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Amazon Music, as well as other podcast directories. If you are on social media, you can connect with an approved workman there as well. I'm on Instagram at an approved workman. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash an approved workman 215. And we're also on Pinterest, pinterest.com slash an approved workman. Finally, if you want to listen or uh, take this lesson in video format, you can subscribe to our video channels on either YouTube or Rumble, and then you won't miss any upcoming episodes. Today, we're lesson number four in the series, Rebuilding on the Solid Rock, from the book of Ezra. This is volume one of our series, After the Exile, a study of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. The lesson for today is titled, The Restoration of Worship, Part 2. Our focus passage is Ezra chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. So please find your way in your Bible to that passage. In Ezra chapter 3, we see Zerubbabel and Jeshua leading the effort to rebuild the altar and the temple. In our previous episode, we began our study of Ezra chapter 3 with our first division, the proper way of worship, from verses 1 through 7. In those verses, we saw how the returning exiles were committed to following the Torah faithfully. That was their top priority. We saw also that the author wants to continuously convey the strong sense of community and unity among the exiles. Remember, this is a select group, the faithful remnant that was steered by Yahweh to return and to rebuild. They are committed to him and committed to work together. The exiles knew they needed Yahweh's favor and protection, and that all started with the proper worship being restored by rebuilding the altar. Let's review the principle and application from our teaching from part one of our study. The principle, proper worship of the Lord requires a wholehearted commitment. Proper worship of the Lord requires a wholehearted commitment. As a way of application questions, we ask, how is my worship honoring God as he and he alone deserves? And how are my worship practices influencing my relationship with him. If you miss our previous episode, I encourage you to catch up on the podcast or watch the video version of that lesson. Here's our lesson outline and goal for our teaching from Ezra chapter 3. Last time we looked at verses 1 through 7, the proper way of worship. Today we will focus on our second division, the proper place for worship, verses 8 through 13. The exiles will now turn their attention to the rebuilding of the temple. And the goal for this teaching from Ezra chapter 3 is this, to encourage believers to remember that the Lord must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Again, the goal for this lesson is this, to encourage believers to remember that the Lord must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Let's go then to our second division from Ezra chapter 3, the proper place for worship, verses 8 through 13. Let's get started. Now 
Now in the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Jeshua, the son of Josedach, and the rest of their brothers, the priests and the Levites, and all who came from the captivity to Jerusalem, began the work and appointed the Levites, who were twenty years old and upward, to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Then Jeshua with his sons and brothers stood united with Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah and the sons of Henadad, with their sons and brothers the Levites, to oversee the workmen in the temple of God. Verse 10. Now, when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his favor is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout of joy when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Verse 12, Yet many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' households, the old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, while many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of the weeping of the people, because the people were shouting with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. Ezra 3, verses 8 through 13. As we focus in this division, let's start first with verses 8 and 9, time for rebuilding. Looking at verse 8, is the second year after the return to the temple at Jerusalem, probably 537 BC. Then it tells us that it's in the second month, probably April, May. Zerubbabel and Jeshua led the people at this time to begin the work to rebuild the temple. This happened seven months after the daily worship was reestablished. They probably had to wait until the materials from Lebanon arrived. Now, who joined in the effort, the rebuilding effort? Well, everyone, the rest of the people, the priests, and the Levites, all of those who returned from captivity were joined in this effort. The leaders appointed Levites who were at least 20 years old to oversee the work on the temple. Verse 9 tells us that Jeshua with his sons and brothers stood united with Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah or Hodaviah, and then uh, or Hodeva, and the sons of Henadad to oversee the work of the restoration of the temple. The different names you will see in uh, Ezra, but also in Nehemiah. So regardless of uh, the differences in names, he's probably talking about the same group of people. Again, what we see here is that strong sense of community and unity again. The civilian leaders and the religious leaders were united in this one purpose, rebuild the temple. Moving ahead to verses 10 through 13, we see that this is also a time for worship, joy, and weeping. In verse 10, we're told that when the builders finished laying the foundation of the temple of the Lord, it was time for the dedication of it. The priests stood with their garments and trumpets. Remember that the people had donated priestly garments when they returned to the land. We saw that in Ezra chapter 2. The Levites, the sons of Asaph, had symbols. They came together to praise the Lord according to what King David had established as the order of worship. And you can read about that in 1 Chronicles 6, 31 and 32, chapter 16, verses 4 through 6, and chapter 25, verses 1 and 2. There is again that commitment to follow the prescribed order of things for the proper worship of the Lord. In his commentary on Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah, Dr. J. Vernon McGee speaks on the joy that accompanied this time of worship. He says, quote, So far, these people have only built an altar and laid the foundation for the temple. 
but they are so thrilled and enthusiastic that they act as though the entire temple has been rebuilt. They had a dedication service, a time of praise, and some praises to God. It was a thrilling experience for them. End quote. Verse 11, we're told that they sang, praising and giving thanks to Yahweh, saying, For he is good, for his favor is upon Israel forever. These words of praise echo the ones used in several psalms, but also in two significant events in the people's history. First, it, it occurred when King David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. You can read about that in 1 Chronicles 16. There was no temple yet. But David had prepared a tent in Jerusalem to host the ark. The second event is when King Solomon brought the ark into the finished temple. You can read about that in 2 Chronicles 5. Both events are focused on the taking of the ark to its proper place. Why is that important? I want to pause here for a moment to talk about the ark of the covenant. Here's what we learn from the Lexham Bible Dictionary about it. Quote, a wooden chest overlaid with gold that contained the tablets of the law. It served both practical and symbolic purposes and was instrumental in both rituals and miracles. The Israelites believed the Ark of the Covenant was symbolically Yahweh's throne representing his very presence on earth. End quote. And again, this is an entry in the Lexham Bible Dictionary by Daniel Sarlo and John T. Swan. Now, when you read here in chapter 3 of Ezra, there is no mention of the ark. It could be because the temple is not finished yet, so it, the ark cannot be there. Or it could be because the ark was lost during the destruction of the temple in 586 B.C. I find it curious that in all the descriptions of what Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple and what Cyrus later returned to the people, there is no mention of the ark. Whatever the situation, the people shouted with a great sound of joy because the foundation of the temple was laid. It was the beginning of the rebuilding of the place that was central to their worship of Yahweh. Therefore, it was a time for rejoicing. In his commentary on Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah, Dr. Brenneman comments on this response of the people. He says, quote, These verses again show the theological interests of the author. He put worship at the center of community life and emphasized God's goodness and love. He also stressed continuity with the pre-exilic worship practices, emphasizing the importance of the priests and the sons of Asaph whom David had assigned to worship with musical instruments. The author even quotes from a psalm frequently used earlier. Jeremiah 33.11 had prophesied that after Jerusalem was destroyed in this same place, this psalm will again be sung with gladness, joy, and thank offerings. Though there was not yet a temple, God was enthroned upon the praises of Israel. End quote. In verses 12 and 13, we see, however, that many of the priests, Levites, and heads of households, and the older men were weeping with a loud voice, while others were shouting with great joy. Why is that? Because they had seen the first temple built by Solomon. They remember how glorious it was and were weeping for its destruction and perhaps the loss of the ark. It is possible also that they knew this rebuilt temple could not equate that first one in splendor and were weeping for its loss. But I think also these older men were weeping because the loss of opportunity. The kingdom of Israel, the unified kingdom, reached its zenith during the days of Solomon. However, it was because of Solomon's idolatry that the kingdom was split in two, and it was a downward spiral from that moment until both Israel and Judah were led into exile. The sounds of joy and weeping were so loud that the people could not distinguish between them. 
The sounds were also so loud that they could be heard from far, far away. However, even with the mix of joy and sorrow, the people were committed to this new beginning. It was an honest, heartfelt, truthful commitment to Him, to Yahweh. The people, they would need encouragement in the days ahead. Opposition would rise and discouragement would set in. The work of rebuilding will be delayed, as we will see in future lessons. However, God is still with them. The Lord would later use the prophet Haggai to encourage them in this new beginning. He would assure them of his presence with them, even if they didn't have the ark or a glorious temple. In his commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah, Dr. Derek Kidner comments on the prevailing attitude and faith of the worshippers in light of these small beginnings. He says, quote, So the crescendo continues to the strange close of the chapter. Once again, there are conscious echoes of Solomon's celebrations, though there are contrasts too. This time there is no ark, no visible glory, indeed no temple, only some beginnings and small beginnings at that. But God is enthroned on the praises of Israel, and this could be as glorious as Solomon's. Perhaps they were more so, for while they matched the earlier occasion word for word and almost instrument for instrument, they were sung in conditions more conductive to humility than to pride and called for a faith that had few earthly guarantees to bolster it. End quote. For now, they had completed the first steps to restore the proper worship of Yahweh. Their hearts were committed to Him. That's the most important thing for a follower of the Lord. What does your heart say about Him? Well, that's the end of our second division. What's our principle? Proper worship of the Lord occurs in spirit and in truth. Proper worship of the Lord occurs in spirit and in truth. But a time is coming and even now has arrived when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshippers. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. As I live each day, how is my worship of God honoring Him, regardless of where I find myself? How is the worship of God bringing joy into my life? How is my life showing that I worship in spirit and in truth? Well, that's our lesson for today. How can we apply what we have learned in Ezra chapter 3? This chapter was focused on the restoration of the proper worship of the Lord by the returning exiles. They knew that they needed to get this right in order to have an ongoing, fruitful relationship with Yahweh. Therefore, they were fu fully united, fully committed to the Torah, and more importantly, they were fully committed to Him. I want to leave you with three lessons we can learn from the faithful remnant that we can apply to our personal worship of God, the right worship of God, the right way to worship God. First, worship from the heart. The exiles came united as one person and were sincere in their worship of the Lord. In the days prior to the exile, the prophets of the Lord regularly condemned Israel and Judah for worship that was only perfunctory and external. It was not acceptable to Him. We can also get caught in the externals of our worship traditions. The most important thing for God is that our worship is honest and sincere. Second, worship with all your heart. Another big issue for God's people prior to the exile was the fact that they were guilty of spiritual adultery. Their worship and allegiance was not to Yahweh and to Him alone. They also went after other gods, so they ended up with divided loyalties. That's not going to work with the Lord. And what about us? 
is there something else competing with our complete allegiance to the Lord? Are our hearts fully and solely committed to Him and Him alone? Finally, not only we ought to worship from the heart, we also ought to worship with all your heart, but also we need to worship with a clean heart. The exile set out to complete the task to remove any defilement on the altar for the burnt offerings and on the side of the temple. Everything had to be reset, cleansed, atoned for. Today, believers are mini tabernacles and mobile temples. The Spirit of the living God indwells each of those who have called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is our primary place of worship pure and free of defilement? Are we approaching God with clean hands and pure hearts? That concludes our teaching from Ezra chapter 3. Thank you for being here today. In our next episode, we will begin our study of Ezra chapter 4. Until then, this is Jose Figueroa for In a Proof Workman, where we are rightly dividing the word of truth. May God richly bless you.